Okay, chapter 31. The title is The Politics of Boom and Bust. Okay, so in the last chapter, we talked about the election of Warren Harding, who looked very grandfatherly and won the election based on his uh, political slogan, Return to Normalcy, is exactly what Americans wanted in the 1920s. Americans were going to turn inward, um, like we talked about, and he was the perfect guy for that. Uh, but the thing was, he just uh, was a really nice guy and uh, trusted everyone when he probably shouldn't have trusted everyone. Um, and they took advantage of him. Uh, corrupt people like Senator Albert Fall of New Mexico um, and Harry Doherty are going to take advantage of him. Uh, when it comes to business, Harding took the approach of uh, laissez-faire again, uh, just like during the Gilded Age. So it's uh, history repeating itself. You're getting uh, going back to the Gilded Age where businesses run in the show and, uh, you know, they're going to try to make as many as much profit as they possibly can. And the little man is going to get squashed again. A laissez faire approach is a hands off approach. So government was going to just say, hey, business, do whatever you want. We're not going to regulate you. So here we go again. They urge business to regulate themselves. And you know how that's going to turn out. The plan was not simply for government to keep their hands off business, but for government to help guide business along the path of profits. So it's not exactly um, laissez-faire, it's government intervening to actually help big business uh, by, you know, once again, here we go again, it's increasing the tariff. All during the progressive era, you know, both parties were talking about lowering the tariff to promote international trade. Well, international trade means we'd have to deal with other countries. And we know in the 1920s, America was steadfastly against dealing with other countries. They didn't want to at all. So uh, this would give them the opportunity to do what they their goal is in the 20s and turn inward and jack up the tariff as high as we can. Americans buy American and we don't buy anything foreign. Um, so antitrust laws were once again not enforced. Sherman antitrust went by the wayside again. So it's it's just, you know, again, just gilded age all over again. We know that Taft also appointed a, Supreme, a new Supreme Court justice, and it just so happened to be the former president, William Howard Taft. I told you earlier that Taft has the distinction of, of uh, you know, serving in another higher, a high capacity after uh, his presidency, which was very rare. Um, once you're at the top as the president, you know, you rarely ever go do anything else, but Taft did. He became the Chief Justice of the United States. Post-war, post-World War I, um, American government controls disappeared, like the War Industries Board, the Food U.S. Food Administration, the War La Labor Board, um, the Committee of Public Information. They didn't need those anymore. So those government co congressional organizations just went by the wayside. Um, railroads that were temporarily controlled by the government so that um, they wouldn't get railroaded, uh, went back in the hands of private corporations. Um, so they were, you know, trying to get rid of some of the ships that they had accumulated during the war. And labor membership is going to shrink by 30% uh, between 1920 and 1930. And the reason it's going to shrink is because big business is running the show again. And big business hates labor union because Haber hates labor unions because they're going to cost them a lot of money and they're going to take advantage of the uh, red scare and they're going to say that you know if you're part of a union you're a commie and the worst thing that you could be called in the 1920s or the 1950s for that matter would be a commie because of the red scare red scare one because red scare two happens in the 50s so we we tried to not totally turn our back on the world because that wouldn't be very appropriate. Um, we didn't sign the Treaty of Versailles because of our uh, disdain for getting involved in the, the uh, League of Nations. Uh, so we were still technically at war with Germany, although we're not fighting. In July 1921, a joint resolution was passed in Congress that officially ended the war. But again, we never signed that Treaty of Versailles. There was a Washington disarmament conference um, in, in which there was a plan to de-escalate, cut down the amount of ships that we had, because, you know, the, the fear was that if we have a lot of ships and a lot of ammunition and weapons that we could potentially get in another war. So there was a disarmament conference in D.C. 
uh, and the United States, Great Britain, Japan, Italy were involved in that. And I'll talk about it on the next slide. We also uh, signed an agreement called the kellogg Brion Pact that outlawed war, um, you know, basically said that countries will not use war and will never get involved in another world war. Obviously, that didn't happen, but it was signed. It was basically a waste of time. There was a stipulation in there that you can go to war if you were ever attacked or if it was for self-defense. So here's the five power treaty that I was talking about where you set a ratio of ships. So the United States, Britain could produce five ships. Japan could produce three for our five. France, 1.67. It's a ratio based on the amount of ships that we had before this treaty. So the United States had way more ships than say France or Italy. So we're not going to all go down to that number, but we're going to definitely cut our our ships by a certain percentage a ratio so that basically it was a, a worldwide decision to de-escalate to prevent future wars. But it didn't last long. And here's the kellogg Brion Pact that was signed um, by all these countries right here, 15 nations outlawing war. And, and again, the kellogg Brion Pact is going to be quickly um, violated, you know, not but probably a couple years after it was signed, um, different skirmishes that we'll be talking about. Okay, now we know that Republicans at this point are with big business and big business is back in that mode of we got to jack up the tariff as high as we can. So Republicans are once again, just like in the Gilded Age, trying to raise the tariff as much as they can. And what's going to happen here is it's going to help cause a worldwide depression because international trade is going to go down to nothing. The Ford New McCumber tariff was passed that uh, went from 27% to 35%. We know that the McKinley tariff earlier was up a lot higher than that, but it, during the progressive era, the, the tariff went down. Now it's on its way back up. Um, one of the biggest scandals in presidential history, I mean, there's been a lot of them, but the Teapot Dome scandal um, was uh, happened under the nose of President Harding. He didn't know about it, but that's never an excuse. If you didn't know about it, if you're in a leadership position and you didn't know about it, you should have known about it. Uh, Albert Fall, Secretary of the Interior, who's in charge of all the uh, natural resources in the country, leased land in Teapot Dome, Wyoming, um, and in, also in California, Elk Hills, Southern California, to uh, an oil man named Henry Sinclair and uh, Edward Do Doheny. But uh, what they were doing is they were allowing private companies to come and illegally uh, take oil out of the ground and sell it on the open market. And then they'd pass around money, you know, as hush money so people wouldn't say anything. Um, yeah, so it was an unfortunate scandal. Um, and, and, you know, it, it resulted in uh, arrests later on, um, but obviously, you know, Harding said, claimed he didn't know about it, but before this whole thing came out, he's gonna die in office. Let's talk about President Harding's death. Uh, it says here, President Harding died in bed in San Francisco in the Palace Hotel. He had been sick with pneumonia a few days before. Doctors pronounced that his death was due to a stroke Harding's death occurred before the full scope of the scandals that had taken place uh, during his administration were known. It is a strange and mysterious death. Um, you know, so here's what happened. Within minutes of Warren Harding's death at either 710, 720, or 730, on August 2nd, 1923, rumors began to circulate. No one present at his demise could give the correct time of death. No one seemed to be sure who was on hand in the San Francisco hotel room when he breathed his last. Most of all, the four physicians who had been caring for Harding for the previous week could not agree on the cause of death. It had something to do with his heart. On the other hand, perhaps it was a stroke. Alternatively, it could have been both exacerbated by a tomain poisoning that may or may not have experienced a few days earlier in Vancouver. Despite the confusion over the time of death, surely an autopsy would re resolve the uncertainty about what killed Warren Harding, except there was no autopsy. Mrs. Harding, the Duchess, as her husband called her, would not permit it. Within an hour of his death, he was embalmed, rouged, powdered, dressed, and in his casket. By morning, he was on trade and headed back to D.C. So, um, you know, the thing about Warren Harding is uh, he kind of fooled around a lot on Florence Harding. 
has there been speculation that she did something? Maybe that she might have poisoned him or something, but uh, it, it that theory has not taken up much traction. But he did oftentimes uh, is well well known and well documented that he uh, would oftentimes have affairs with different women. All right, let's talk about who take, took over for him. Uh, his vice president was Calvin Coolidge, and it was 2.30 in the morning on August 3rd, 1923. While visiting in Vermont, Calvin Coolidge received word that he now was president. Uh, he was very serious, and he didn't say very much. He was very, very quiet, um, kind of a shy person. But he became very popular because in the 20s, the economy was going through the roof. People were investing in the stock market. Um, things were going well financially in this country. Uh, they called it Coolidge prosperity. He probably had little to do with the prosperity. It just was what was going on during these times. It was just an up and down cycle in, in the economy. Uh, but he certainly got credit for it. And here he is shaking the hand of the winningest pitcher in baseball history, Walter Johnson. During this time, though, even though, you know, people were making a lot of money and um, the stock market and business was was booming. Farmers were very frustrated. Farmers continued to produce like they did during World War I. Never had farmers ever had been more successful than they were during World War I, simply because everything that they produced was bought up by the United States government at top dollar, because they had to not only feed our, our troops, but also feed the French and British troops in World War I. So farmers were just making money hand over fist during World War I, and there was no such thing as overproduction. We talked about the, uh, the big O overproduction causing the big D deflation, but that wasn't the case during uh, World War I because there was no overproduction. Everything they produced was bought up at top dollar value. Well, farmers, because they were in that mode of producing so much, continued to produce that much after the war was over. So once again, you're going right back to the way it was before, where the big O is going to cause the big D, deflation, and it's really going to hurt them. It's going to be a huge problem once again. Okay, in the election of 1924, Coolidge is running for the first time. He was vice president, became president because of the death of Harding. A couple of his sayings, the man who builds a factory builds a temple. And then it goes on to say, those who work there, worship there. So the importance of business. He also says, the business of America is business and keep cool with Coolidge. Now these Wilsonian type idealisms, whereas campaign slogans are gonna, going to get him elected in 1924. But the biggest thing about getting elected in 1924 was the economy. People tend to vote their pocketbook. If the economy's going well and people have money, they're going to say, let's keep it going the way it is. And Coolidge is going to win this election in 24. Uh, the Democrats nominated a guy by the name of John Davis and the Progressive Party nominated Robert La Follette. You remember his name. He was the progressive governor of Wisconsin. And there you go. There's your outcome right there. Once again, in 1924, I, I told you in 1920, Solid South was broken when Harding won Tennessee. No, oh, right in 24, it goes right back to Solid South. Americans in their uh, foreign policy continue to preach isolationism, stay out, right? But we weren't afraid to go down to the Dominican Republic and Latin American countries and or Haiti and those places. But when it came to, uh, Europe, we wanted to stay out. Here was the Dawes uh, plan and basically the international financial system. The United States was driving this really. We were giving $2.5 billion in loans to the Germans who were then turning around and paying $2 billion of their small price of their $31 billion that they were owned. They would send that to the allies. The allies would then um, send money to the United States. Now, we convoyed goods over there to the British and the French, and we weren't doing that for free. We told them that they were going to have to pay for this at some point in time. So this is what they're doing. 
So once again, we would turn around and pay, give loans to Germany to pay back the allies who would then pay back us. And the circular system of money kind of kept things going. Now, when the depression hits in the 30s, this all goes to hell in a handbasket. We don't have any money. We're not giving loans to Germany anymore. The German economy is in the toilet, so they're not giving the allies any money. And the allied countries are also in, engaged in a depression, so we're not getting money from them at all comes to a stop. So it's like riding a bicycle down the street and someone sticks a you know, broomstick in your spokes of your bike. You end up going over the handlebars. That's what's going to happen to the international money system during the Great Depression. And in Germany, boy, did they ever have problems. Because they weren't getting money from us, they just started printing out more money. It was one dollar was worth a hundred thousand marks. People were using their money, their paper money, to stay warm, putting it, throwing it in the furnace as fuel for a fire. Take a look at this hyperinflation. In 1914, there were 4.2 German marks to the dollar. In 1919, 14 marks to the dollar, 76.7 and 21, 4 million in. 23, but look at that. I don't even know what that number is, but it's a lot. You needed wheelbarrows of money to go to the store to go buy a loaf of bread, and the wheelbarrow was worth a lot more. So children would play with money. So looking at, at Coolidge's four plus years as president, four plus because of the year he spent as president after the death of Harding, huge gains for big business, no doubt about it. No antitrust legislation, uh, Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, Sherman Antitrust, they were all ignored. Farmers, factory workers, and labor unions suffered tremendously during this time. But overall, you know, probably the, the average person's income was doubled during the 1920s. People were making more money. They were driving cars. There was one, one and a half cars per family nationwide. So in the election of 1928, Coolidge decides he's not going to run. And things are going well, at least it looks like it. And uh, Americans are going to continue to vote their pocketbook. So Herbert Hoover, if you remember Herbert Hoover, he was the uh, leader of the United States Food Administration who fed the world. Uh, he was also the Secretary of Commerce. He was a Quaker. His religion was Quaker. And he was from Oregon. And he was a Stanford grad. So pretty interesting about Hoover. Uh, he promoted prosperity. He talked about prohibition continuing prohibition because there was talk about getting rid of it and rugged individualism do it yourself type attitude rugged individualism hey we're gonna we're gonna try to accomplish things ourselves we're not gonna we're not gonna you know rely on government to um, do that so Al Alfred Smith was the Democrat uh, he drank heavily they called him alcohol Smith uh, but triumph uh, Hoover's gonna triumph Triumph in a landslide, 440 electoral votes to 87 for Smith. And, uh, you know, obviously you could see here Solid South is, is broken um, with Tennessee, North Carolina, and Florida, Virginia, Kentucky, Maryland, all some of those are border states, but Delaware. The Solid South is, is obliterated, Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, so now you've got you just just go show you how popular Hoover was and how many people felt good about the Republicans and where the economy was going. Little do they know everything's going to blow up. Everything's going to blow up. We know that because we know history. We know that the Great Depression is looming, looming large. Hoover wins. Some of his first moves as president because he could see some cracks in the foundation and one of them was farmers uh, and and farmers are you know were, were very much hurting he promoted uh co-ops where farmers get together alliances form alliances with his agricultural marketing act basically it was designed to help farmers help themselves that goes right along with this rugged individualism theme where we're not going to just hand people money we're going to educate them so that they could take care of themselves, help farmers help themselves with the Mar Agricultural Marketing Act. Um, he uh, raised the tariff a you know, huge amount, unbelievable, the highest ever peacetime 
tariff in American history, the Holly Smoot tariff at 60%. Americans were complaining big time with the McKinley tariff at 60%, and now it's jacked up to 60% here. So you've got zero international trade, and uh, it's just going to make things worse. He basically follows in the footsteps of his, the previous two Republicans. So oftentimes, uh, historians will group up Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover together. Three Republicans pre presidents. They promoted big business. They jacked up the tariff as high as they possibly could. And they, they were all about rugged individualism. Okay, so let's talk about the crash of the stock market. Hoover is the one who predicted an end to poverty. He talked about how we are, we are incredibly close to ending poverty altogether. Um, so he predicted the end, but that's, that's not going to happen. That's very ironic. Uh, all of a sudden, it was an anomaly. Everybody wanted to sell their stock. No one wanted to buy it. If everybody would continue to along the path of just buying stocks and staying, staying true, then the stock market wouldn't have, have crashed. But remember, there were so many people that were buying on margin, the true value of stocks were not known. So when the stock started to come down, those then people wanted to get out from underneath their stock. So they wanted to sell it quickly so they could pay off their on margin loans. Remember, you can if you you put in a thousand dollars and it looks like you had ten thousand dollars in stock, and then whenever you make a profit, you paid back the rest of that nine thousand dollars. The rest of it is profit. Well, when the stock started to go down, there was incredible, intense panic that happened in the stock market. And the next thing you know, everybody wanted to sell, nobody wanted to buy, and the stocks by the hour just continued to plummet and plummet and plummet and millionaires became penniless overnight. The suicide rate on this on these days during the crash in October was super high. People were jumping out of windows because they lost everything. By the end of 1934, million Americans were jobless. And two years later, that number shot up to 12 million. One in every four Americans at the height of the depression were out of work. That's 25% of the population. 5,000 banks are going to collapse. People are going to rush to try to get their money and the banks are going to close and everybody's going to lose their money. It's not like their money was protected like it is today. You could see these pictures and you could just feel the panic of people during that time. Tough times. No jobs. People live in, in tents, tent cities. Al Capone started a, a you know, free soup kitchen where people could wait in line and get breakfast. You could see the volatility of the Dow Jones from 1927. It shot up big time and it was at its height right before 29. And then here's Black Tuesday right here where it just came crashing down and then it just continued to come down, down, down. Intense panic nationwide. Now let's talk about some of the causes of these dep the, the Great Depression that are gonna happen. Uh, this is a great essay question. Causes of the, de the depression, and this is both in, in America and worldwide. Overproduction of farms and factories, which causes a surplus of goods and too few consumers. So whether it was farmers producing too much crop or whether it was factories producing too many products, it was all, you know, the, the price was going down, causing deflation. Unequal distribution of wealth caused by people like um, the Secretary of Treasury, Mellon, whose idea was, hey, let's put money in the hands of rich so they'll open up factories and, and they'll provide jobs to Americans and the money will trickle down, the trickle down effect. That's unequal distribution of wealth. Too much money in too few hands. Overexpansion of credit. Too many people buy now, pay later. Technological unemployment. Machines are taking over for people providing less jobs. So that's why the, one of the major reasons for unemployment the circular economic problem, the Dawes plan where everybody stopped paying, including the United States, the lack of international trade due to super high tariffs like the Fordney McCumber tariff and then the Holly Smoot tariff at 60%. And of course, the crash of the stock market contributed to this. The Great Depression was coming no matter what. The crash of the stock market just made it worse. I mean, the Great Depression ha is happening worldwide. 
some examples of what they called at the time, because they're blaming Hoover for this, Hoovervilles, tent cities. Here's one in Oakland down here. Here's one in Seattle. There's one in Sacramento, one in Central Park, New York. People just erecting tents or lean-tos because they don't, they don't have a house anymore. Hoover is, is criticized, sometimes unfairly, sometimes fairly. Um, he's getting the blame for the depression. There's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, critics noted that he could feed millions in Belgium during World War I, but not millions at home in America. And he refused to give handouts. That was Hoover's thing, rugged individualism. He said, we, need, we, can't, we cannot, the government cannot give handouts to people. At the same time, he did some things that, that paved the way for Roosevelt to come in and do some similar things. So he kind of pioneered or started the new deal that Roosevelt's going to use, All right? So he voted to withdraw $2.25 billion to start projects to alleviate suffering from the depression. One of them was Hoover Dam. They dammed up the Colorado River so that they could provide cheap electricity um, and, and also provide jobs. Thousands of people were put to work building the Hoover Dam, many, and most of them were all unemployed before. The establishment of the Reconstru Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which bailed out banks that were going under. And he, he took a lot of criticism for that. Well, why are you giving money to banks, but not to individual people who are homeless and jobless? And his philosophy is, well, if I give money to the banks, they'll stay open and people won't lose their money. He felt that that was more important. And again, remember Hoover's philosophy, rugged individualism. So we'll talk when in class about Hoover Dam, but this is based, This is Hoover Dam. These are intakes right here. The water comes into those big intakes. They come down to the turbines. They, the falling power of falling water turns the turbines, which provides the activity to uh, provide electricity. And there's the big, huge dam that they built that thousands of people were put to work doing. There it is under construction right there. We'll talk more about it. You can see how massive these intakes are where they take the water in and send it to the turbine. Here's where the dam is. The water's backed up here. Here's the uh, intakes. The turbines are underneath the uh, dam. The bonus army, just a, uh, an example of, of people that are down and out. Many, very similar to the Coxie's army, Jacob Coxie, uh, back in the, during the depression in the 1890s. Many veterans who had not been paid their compensation from World War I, uh, marched to Washington, D.C. to demand their entire bonus. The bonus expeditionary march erected unsanitary camps and shacks and vacant lots, creating a health hazard and annoyance. Riots followed after the troops, led by General Douglas MacArthur, came in to intervene, and an 11-month-old baby died from exposure to tear gas. So in an attempt to get the bonus army, who was just uh, out there uh, demanding their, demanding their um, you know, demanding their bonus be paid, they, uh, they, the government sent out the troops and an 11 month old baby died. They called it the Battle of Anacostia Flats. The Japanese in 1931 uh, attacked in Manchuria, uh, violating the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And uh, this is gonna uh, be kind of a snowball effect. The Japanese are gonna be very violent with the Chinese and millions of Chinese are gonna die at the hands of the Japanese. And it kind of opened the door for people like Mussolini and Hitler to do the same. And the, and the League of Nations did nothing. The United States did nothing. So other countries are going, hmm, okay. So this is the way it's gonna go. It's gonna le lead to future aggression. And you can see here the political cartoon, uh, Japan invades Manchuria and you had all these nine power treaties and Kellogg-Briand Pact that were violated because of that. All right, good neighbor policy. Hoover wanted to get along with Latin American countries um, and he needed them for a trade partner. And then later on, Roosevelt's gonna do the same. And here's another picture in there, last picture here uh, of Hoover Dam. And that's the end of chapter 31.